Hello, everybody. I am Tia diaz Bellart with the Seed School of Miami, and I am so excited and honored to introduce you to one of the most amazing and outstanding leaders and pillars of our community, Mr. Jorge Perez. Mr. Perez in, is the founder uh, and the chairman and CEO of the Related Group, which is the largest Hispanic-owned business in the United States and Florida's top multifamily developer. He went to the University of Michigan, graduating with a master's in urban planning. And in 1979, he founded the Related Group and he specialized in low-income affordable housing, beginning in Miami's own Little Havana. And the company's projects rapidly expanded. Today, the Related Group is known for transforming Miami skyline with some of the most iconic buildings. Mr. Perez has also has deep passion for the arts and is a key founder and namesake of Miami-Dade County's beautiful Perez Art Museum, Miami. But nothing is more important to Mr. Perez than his family. His wife, Darlene, is a champion in our community. She is an advanced registered nurse practitioner and clinical researcher with more than 20 years of experience. She received her nursing and nurse practitioner degree from Florida International University. Their four children are well on their way to following in their parents' footsteps. So with that, Mr. Perez, it's an honor to be here with you today. And I am just excited to talk with you and learn more about you and your passions and, and how you've done so many outstanding things. Well, Tia, thank you for such a beautiful uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you. And I congratulate you, of course, and the incredible work that SEED is doing. Thank you, thank you so much. So what I thought we would do today, Mr. Perez, is, is have a little bit of fun. You know, I know you've done so many great big interviews with newspapers and TV shows, so we're just a, a school. Um, so what I want to talk about are things that we know um, our children want to know, our scholars. Our scholars are brilliant, talented, they've got great big dreams, and they are going to learn so many wonderful things from you. So. Um, I know one of the things that they would like to know is, what was the first job that you ever had? Wow. The first job that I ever had was actually here in Miami while I was going to school to help me pay for school. I was really not used to having a job. And I came from Colombia, South America. Uh, my parents are Cuban, but they went into exile in Colombia. So when I came here, I didn't have much money. And I started with Miami-Dade Junior College, as you know, which is a public school. Um, and I was a pizza cook. So mm -hmm. I, um, I flipped pizzas for two years while I was attending Miami-Dade. Um, and, um, and that was a great learning experience for me. Got to meet a lot of people. Uh, so that was my first real job, you know, very hot job inside a kitchen. Uh, but it was a great learning experience. When, when I finally did finish school, I was very lucky to meet this Frenchman. And my first real job as a college graduate was as an international marketing consultant. So I would be telling European firms um, at age 22 um, what they should do to enter the U.S. market. And it was a, a fabulous job. It taught me a lot about uh, people, what they needed. Um, and I did a lot of market research, of course, for these companies, uh, which has helped me uh, tremendously all through my career. So they were very interesting jobs. I've been one of those very lucky people that has always found mentors and um, people that took a liking to me and gave me opportunities. Outstanding, outstanding. Well, well, here's the real question then. Do you like or do you hate pizza now as a result of your first job? <laughs> I love pizza. <laughs> love as a matter of fact, I should weigh 400 pounds because I could eat pizza all day long. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, we're big pizza fans over here too, without a doubt, without a doubt. And, and when you then moved on to um, found the Related Group, and, and start also in affordable housing. What gave you the idea and the inspiration to do that? Look, if Tia, it's, it's funny because if, if when I was, when I finished high school or even when I finished college, uh, or even where really when I finished graduate school, if somebody would have said that 
I would be a developer and a businessman, I think people would have died laughing because I really was a very socially conscious person. I always thought that what I was going to do was uh, teach or do a social service job. I, um, I came from Colombia where the discrepancies between the rich and the poor are, are very visible. And I wanted to do something to, to change the world. So all my career, I studied um, first economics, then uh, international development, thinking that I was gonna go maybe back to South America. And when I decided to stay in this country, urban planning, not to become a businessman, but to help uh, lower income neighborhoods develop. Um, so when I finished school at the University of Michigan, um, I got a job in the city of Miami um, as a planner. So I would go to lower income neighborhoods and really help them change. You know, build roads, build water, build sewer, build schools, build community buildings, help them get jobs and do all those type of development work, uh, which was very satisfying. And almost by mistake, um, I was doing uh, a job for, as a consultant for a private company that involved finding buildings to rehabilitate with government programs to provide housing for the poor. Um, I loved it, you know, I all of a sudden said, my goodness, this is a way of doing public service and at the same time making money um, and actually physically building buildings. Um, I started with buildings in Little Havana in the area of Overtown in Miami, doing some very small buildings, first as a consultant. And then I decided, well, if I, if I can tell these people how to do it, maybe I can do it myself. And that's how I started with my first two buildings. One was uh, a 1920 um, building in Little Havana, 21 units called the uh, Orlando Apartments. And the other one was called the Buena Vista Apartments. And it was in, in, um, in Overtown in the Colmer area of Miami. And I still own those buildings. They started, I did those in 1978. And um, 42 years later, we still own those little two buildings. And they're the great reminder for me of where I started. So I became a businessman and a developer almost by chance. Amazing, amazing. What, what a, a beautiful chance that was. And, you know, what are, being an entrepreneur, it's, it's got to be a little scary because everything's on your shoulders. So what's, what's it like when you decided to step out on your own and, and to take that and, and, and grow your business? What's it like to be your own boss and pioneer? Very scary, right? I mean, very scary. But I have this philosophy that fear either makes you become much better or it makes you become totally inactive. So you can be afraid and sit back and say, no, I'm not gonna take risks and let fear um, hold you back. Or you can say, my God, I really have to work twice as hard as anybody or else I'm gonna go broke and this is not gonna work. So um, I, I, was petrified every day. All of a sudden, not only do I have to support myself, but I have a payroll. At the beginning, it was a little payroll, right? But I have to pay salaries for people. Uh, I had to pay loans to banks. Um, so it was very, very scary, the responsibility that you have not only to yourself, but others. And at the same time, I had a very young family then. Um, and uh, I, I, I'd be lying to you if I didn't feel like every day I was going to go broke. You know, I had to figure out where the money was going to come uh, to pay for all this. As a matter of fact, I'm still at age 70 and having the successful company scared that every day something is going um, to happen that is wrong. But I think that's what keeps me on my toes. You know, that's what keeps me from being very competitive. You know, I feel that this country is a country with the greatest opportunities for success, but also the most competitive country in the world. If you're not the best at what you do, somebody's gonna come in, do it better, 
and take your place. So we, I am, and the DNA of our company is very aware of that. We don't rest on our laurels and every day we become better. It was just like when I went to school. I wasn't a great school. I wasn't great at high school. I think I was smart enough, but I wasn't applying myself. But then when I went to college, I started understanding that when you apply yourself, you start doing better. You start feeling better about yourself. And I became a very good student. Um, and I think this is a lesson that also came in with the way you see yourself and the way you understand that only through extreme hard work are you going to able to succeed. So, so when, when they tell me, um, is this intelligence? And I, I probably say, no, the combination is about 80% hard work and 20% intelligence. Um, and hard work really is the most important. And, um, wonderful, wonderful. And, and I know that's certainly a lesson that all of our scholars would love to learn because I know some people think it's, it's luck and, and it's just by coincidence, but it's really hard work and, and just pursuing it. And I, I love the idea of just doing everything you can to stay at the top because if you're not the best, somebody else will come along and take it away from you. So that's a great, great life lesson. And, and you also have this amazing passion um, for, for arts, for the arts. So it's multiple forms of arts that you have a passion for and, and you have the beautiful um, museum that's named after you. Congratulations on that. It is beautiful and spectacular and such a, a fantastic part of Miami's uh, culture. And when you talk about art, it's, it's interesting because art for everybody is, is unique. It, it hits certain things, will hit them differently than it will hit a different person. Is there anything in particular that for you as a connoisseur that you say, okay, this is, these are the kinds of things that I gravitate towards and, and, and share a little bit about how you develop this passion for art? Yeah. Um, from early on, probably kicking and screaming, my mother used to drag me to museums. Um, and I think this was important on creating that sense of um, love for beauty, uh, not just art. I love movies. I love things that are visual, you know, uh, that my eyes, you know, look at um, and, 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 and help me understand the world around me. I think art has been proven to change people's lives in a very positive manner. So when you look at, for example, I was a member of the National Endowment of the Arts, which is the national organization that supports the arts. We did studies and we found out that the, 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 the sooner children are exposed to art in their school curriculums and so forth and taken to museums, the better that they do, not just scholastically, but in their life skills. Art takes you away, at least takes me, and I think takes other people away from the day-to-day -day paths that we have. I think as a businessman, so my paths are fairly narrow, you know, and it allows me to expand creatively. So I love meeting with artists and looking at their work and trying to understand their work because the artist really explains in beautiful ways what has gone in the past, what is going on in the present, and helps you understand what is going on in the future. So art has made my life better. And that's why I think uh, that it's very important to me not to have a collection that is my collection, but a collection that goes to the whole community so they can experience the same things and grow in the same way through art as I have grown. So when people say, aren't you proud of the, what's the proudest that you're in at the, on the Perez Art Museum? And I always think back and I say, you know what it is? When all the public school kids come in free, particularly the younger ones, and they sit with their professors, their teachers, and the curators of the museum, and they're just for the first time looking at these great pieces of art and they're sitting on the floor and they're asking this incredibly imaginative questions. And you see that their minds are being opened to new worlds. Um, that's what I am proudest of. And I think art is just like, just like going through education and so forth and having a great job feeds the stomach. 
art feeds the soul and the imagination. Wonderful, wonderful. And, and I know that many of our seed scholars have had the chance to visit your museum. And as our new scholars come in, we're gonna be sure of course that they all get to go there um, because it is something that everyone needs to see for sure and experience that uh, without a doubt. Um, what? If, if I can interrupt one second, because I think it's important for you guys uh, uh, later on, and I will be so glad to invite you to both have a guided tours of, um, of um, I volunteer actually for the guided tours of the shows that are gonna be coming up, uh, up um, now. We are closed. We have two, you have the Museum PAM, which is the large museum. And then we have an experimental space called El Espacio in Alapata, a neighborhood of Miami. Um, the first exhibit of El Espacio was the artist as a social change agent. So we got all these artists that talk about society and all the injustices of society, racism, sexism, exploitation, capitalism, and all the inequalities in the world. And it was an extremely successful. We started getting all the high school students to come and then COVID hit, unfortunately, but we had a great program of providing buses to all the public schools in Miami so they could come and attend. The next exhibit that we're hoping to open in November is being curated by a great African curator from South Africa. And the, 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 it's going to be on African contemporary art, the largest exhibit done on, by African artists from the continent of Africa in the United States. At the same time, Pam is going to have one which talks about the diaspora which is the relationship between African-American artists in the United States and African artists in Africa. So those two collections together, those two exhibitions should be an incredible job to see how people of color have contributed and the, the, the intelligence and the creativity of those artists. It's a very important show for me. You know, I do, I have collected um, in a very intensive way art from Africa, contemporary art from Africa, just like I've collected contemporary art from Latin America. So you're all invited and I am sure that you will enjoy. It really is going to be an incredible exhibition. Thank you for that. We will love it. I know our whole team, all of our scholars would be just cannot wait. That would be wonderful. We look forward to it. And, and aside from, from art and how hard you work, do you have any other hobbies, any other things that you do to relax or in your spare time? Or do you have any spare time? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I'm, you know, in my old age, I am pretty good at combining almost seamlessly what is, um, what are the different hats that I wear. And I would break it down into four, actually five areas where I split my time. I, I, I exercise my body so I can, so I'm still stay alive. And mm -hmm. I do that mostly through tennis. I am a passionate tennis player, no longer as good as I used to be, but still a pretty competitive tennis player. So that's a bit. My family, of course, is the most important. And I try to spend as much time as fa of family time as I can, particularly since my male sons, my daughter, is a social worker, but my male sons are all interested in the business without me forcing them. So I have to teach him to continue that legacy. Then it's business, you know, just day to day going to the business and doing work so I can continue to make money to do the last two things, which are the arts and then philanthropy. Philanthropy consumes a huge part of what I, me, myself and our family does. So um, I belong to something called the giving pledge in which I've pledged that 50% of whatever I'm worth goes to uh, philanthropy. It goes to uh, charitable organizations, schools, education, art, um, poverty, inequality, all those type of things. And uh, that's become a very, very big part of our uh, of our daily life. We have a foundation um, with several people working in it and that's all they do full time um, under, uh, under my guidance. Wonderful, that's just, just amazing. And definitely 
keeps you busy with all of those things. And, you know, when you, when you speak about, about philanthropy, that's one of the things that we teach our scholars is that it's so important to give back and, and that there's, it's so rewarding and so self-fulfilling that, um, that that's an important part of, of what we are uh, teaching them and sharing with them. Do you have any lessons that you would like to share with our scholars on, on what giving back means and how they can, um, how they can be able to give back themselves? Yeah, look, we, we live in a, in a great country that still has a lot of issues, as your scholars know. A lot of inequalities, um, a lot of people that don't have the opportunities to succeed as other people's have. My role is sort of to make this an equal playing field. If I do that, then it's up to that individual, you know, to take, to take the bull by the horns and become successful. It doesn't mean financially successful, it means successful in whatever it is that they want to do with their lives. So there's a saying which I now come to really understand and believe. It is much better to give than to take. There is nothing more fulfilling than giving back. Mm -hmm. To change a person's life for the better is the greatest thing a human being I think can do. Um, so when they say, wow, you do this because you're good. No, I do this because I'm selfish. It really makes me feel so good doing what I do. And once you start doing it, I think you get hooked. I think it makes you just a better person. And I think that's what we should all strive for, right? To become better members of society. Mm -hmm. Um, and philanthropy really is, um, is something that is not just going to make my world better, but in the city that hopefully my children will be and the grandchildren and great grandchildren will be in, will make it a much better, just and progressive society. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. So, so a couple of questions where I don't want to take up much more of your time, but you, you just have such great, great, um, things that you're sharing that I know our kids are going to love it. Um, a couple of fun ones right now. Have you ever played video games? And if so, what are, what are your favorites? I, I only have tried to play video games with my sons as they were growing up. And I think my hand-to-eye coordination when it comes to video games stinks. So I got tired <laughs> of them beating me badly. So I did not become a very good video game player. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and you mentioned tennis, um, but are, you, are there any other sports that you're a fan of? Do you follow any teams or any, or any particular well, players? Well, I, I am. Um, I'm the vice chairman of the Miami Dolphins. I don't know if you know that. So uh, I'm part of the ownership team of the, of the, of the football. I, football to me was a round ball in which you kick into, uh, into a goal um, uh, growing up in South America. I, I passionately loved and played soccer. Mm -hmm. And now that I am here, I become a great um, Dolphin fan. I love basketball. I played basketball um, in high school. We actually won the high school national championship. And, um, and I thought I was a very good basketball player until I came to the United States and I, realized, I went to try to play in college and I realized that I really wasn't that good. Um, but I still passionately love basketball. And that one is one that I still do pick one-on-ones uh, on -ones on my kids who are much younger than me and are 6'4 and 6'5. So it's pretty hard for me to play against them. Um, so, so yes, I love sports. Um, mm. I think they've always played an important part of my life. Um, and at the same time, I passionately love reading, for example. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't pick a work of fiction, which is what I like to read, and read two or three hours a day. Uh, when I wake up, I read at six in the morning, one hour. And when I go to sleep, I read at least one or two hours. It's a sort of a necessary, uh, I've gotten so used to that. Um, and when I was in college, 
I, one of my uh, sub majors was uh, literature. So I've always enjoyed uh, reading very, very much. That's great. That's great. We have, um, we have a program, which I think you've heard about, which we shared earlier, called Drop Everything and Read, Dear. So we encourage our scholars, it's mandatory to do exactly that. So I'm glad that they're following in, in the best footsteps possible. Best way, best way to improve your mind. That's great. That is great. And so, so last question, are there any things that, that you would like to share with our scholars in particular, kind of like life lessons or things that you wish you knew then that you know now, um, or just kind of inspirations for them that you want to wrap it up with? Yeah, look, I mean, when, when, when I'm asked to give advice, you know, and I remember um, one of the funny stories, um, because I think you had asked me, or is there something that people don't know about you? One of the biggest mm -hmm. things that people don't know about me, and you see it here and you say, well, that it can be, is I am really shy. And I don't like speaking in public. Um, so much so uh, that when I finished college, I was a valedictorian in my university. And uh, I was so afraid of public speaking that I quote and unquote got sick and I really wasn't sick, just so I would not have to be valedictorian and have to give a speech in front of all these people. So again, you really work through your deficits, right? So this wasn't what I was good at. I had to really work twice as hard in order to get, um, to, to move away from that fear of public speaking, fear of being with people. I'm still not great at it and it takes a lot of effort for me to do it. Um, but in order for you to be successful in almost everything, you have to do it. The other thing that I think is most important as they are growing up is that life is very tough. Regardless of what you do, um, it's, it's, quite, it's called work, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not called pleasure. Um, so it is really, really important as you decide what you want to do in life that you don't make those decisions based on money, but you base those decisions on what you have a passion for. It is very hard to become good at anything unless you're really passionate about what you do. So I am very lucky. I mean, I love real estate. I love meeting with architects and creating buildings. So for me, I feel like the basketball player that says, I don't know how they pay me for this when I love doing this, even if they wouldn't pay me for this. Well, that's the way I feel about real estate and the things that I do. So as, as, as you become more and more knowledgeable what about what your real passions are, pursue those Pursue those aggressively, but don't get into something that is not for you. It, it, is, it is the easiest way to be sad and to be probably unsuccessful. Outstanding. What, what great words of wisdom. And I think that alone is probably one of the single most difficult issues that our young scholars are facing is because they're trying to decide their whole futures. What are their careers going to be? What path do they follow? And, and that alone, that piece of advice alone is going to be giving them great joy and passion for their futures and, and, and success. So that's great. That is great. Well, I, I am so grateful for your time and this was amazing. I can't wait to share this with our scholars. Um, and, and we're just really appreciate you for the leadership that you've given our community, for all of the great things that, that you do for, for South Florida and for so many places that, that you're able to, um, to build in and provide support for and do great things with. And, and so we just thank you and wish, wish you and your whole entire beautiful family all the very best. Well, Thea, thank you very much for having it and good luck to you and to all your scholars. And I really look forward to showing you and all the scholars um, the art exhibits that we are going to have, which we're going to start at the end of the year. So I look forward to that. We do too. We cannot wait. Thank you again. And, uh, and we'll be seeing you soon. Bye.